and not sit on it. Thank you much, Larry. Good morning, some afternoon by now. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Good. Good. Can you all see okay? This background is darker than most of them. I just wanted to have a Turkish flag up there at the beginning, so it's a little darker background. We'll go from there. Uh, I know a number of you have been here before. It's wonderful to see you back again. Some of you are here for the first time. Welcome. I hope you have a lot of fun and get a lot of questions answered. What my aim for today is to do is, I, that was an awkward sentence. What my aim for today is, is I'd like to go through some basic things in Tur uh, about Turkey. I've got a list of what I'm going to explain here in a bit. And as we go, as you have questions, feel free to throw them out, and I'll do my best to answer them. If we have a little bit of time at the end, I'd love to, like, we'll be ending the presentation actually with a couple big questions that America faces in terms of how we're going to relate with Turkey in the long term. And I'd love to hear some of y'all's ideas on how you think we should answer them. We're the citizens, we're the ones who one way or another run our government, in theory. So us knowing what we think our government should do seems like it might be useful. As we go, I tend to talk somewhat quickly occasionally. If you miss anything, just wave at me and go, slow down, you young punk. And I'm going to slow down. I can also tell me to get off your lawn if you'd like. I'm getting used to doing that to kids now, and I'm very excited that I now have that ability. As the hairline recedes, the lawn shooting improves. So, with that, one more for you. Yeah, the comedy I kind of have, but not really. We'll see. The last thing to let you know. Uh, I have to apologize in advance in that there's one thing I'm going to do which I usually consider very bad form for presenters. Um, my cell phone is actually going to be on, and the reason is my students, I coach a debate team at uh, Boston Latin School, in addition to teaching at Birmingham State and a couple other places. My students are actually on a bus on their way to Yale University to compete in a tournament right now, and as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to run off into my car, break several speed laws, and try to get there about in time. But if there's any emergency or anything, I'm the emergency contact in addition to the chaperone there. So my apologies, I don't expect that there's any reason I would need to, but if my phone goes off, I may actually have to answer it. I'm going to ask your indulgence of that. Cool. Welcome back. So let's talk about Turkey. In particular, there are a few things that we are going to cover today. I want to talk a little about the founding history, how it came to be. We'll talk a little briefly about the Ottoman Empire, and we're going to focus mostly on post-Ottoman Empire, so World War, okay, World War I and afterwards which is when modern Turkey as we know it sort of emerged. In addition, we'll talk about the founding principles. There's a set of principles that when Turkey was initially founded were central to how it identified itself. Things that it thought uh, and its people thought were crucial to maintaining the state as they wanted it to be. We'll outline what those are. Those are principles that still, almost 100 years later, are central to the Turkish Republic and inform most of the political things that happened there. We'll look at the modern history of Turkey, in particular there, I'm thinking, post the death of a gentleman we'll talk about called Ataturk, who was uh, the, fun, the founder of Turkey, uh, so from the 1930s on. And then finally, we'll look at current challenges, what Turkey's dealing with right now, stuff that's happened in the last few decades that's been particularly interesting or troubling, and finally, what choices we as the United States and the rest of the world are likely to face in terms of how we interact with Turkey in the near and far future. So, let's start off here. Maps are useful. I am a firm believer in geopolitics being a thing, which is that the terrain around you and where you are located as a country massively shapes your politics, your policies, and everything about you. So, the Ottoman Empire, this is not the Ottoman Empire at its height. Its height it controlled territory over here, some over here, some back here. Freaking massive. This is the Ottoman Empire on the eve of World War, partly at the beginning of World War I. You know, the little uh, territory, a huge chunk of what we would consider uh, now to be Saudi Arabia, some of the Gulf Emirates, portions of Iran, a lot of territory. This, oh, no, no, there, back, back there. This is post World War One. You might notice a slight difference. After the end of World War One, Turkey was on the losing. Well, the Ottoman Empire at that point was on the losing side, and. After World War I in particular, the victors were really keen on carving up the losers and taking territory as a way to <coughs> solidify their win, right? We won, you lost, so we get your stuff, was pretty much the idea. We did a little bit differently after World War II, partially because we saw that that created a lot of problems, arguably bad decision to take a lot of territory and a lot of control and demand reparations from the losers is a lot of what set the groundwork for World War II in Germany in particular, and we learned a little after that. But in this case, the Ottoman Empire largely ceased to exist. It got shrunk significantly. The territory you see around here, which will later become Turkey in part, was controlled by various other colonial powers, uh, and they eventually ceded parts of that back to Turkey. But this is the major strength that you see between the two. 
After that, we go to the key things that happened in Turkey. So you got World War I, Turkey sides with the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, rather, sides with the Central Powers. One of the main reasons they do that is they're taking a look at what's going on in Germany, and they're like, wow, Germany, you have lots of tech, and you have developed industrially really well. We don't want to fight you, so let's be on the not fighting Germany side. And that put them on Germany's side. Um, uh, in, in, in the conflict. They lose the war pretty badly. They get broken up uh, by the powers that win. And we end up with a much smaller area that used to be the Ottoman Empire and is now Turkey. There are a couple big distinctions between the two that we're going to get into when we talk about Turkey's founding principles. But one of them is that the Ottoman Empire was a sectarian empire. And the same with the Holy Roman Empire was a sectarian empire. It was a religiously oriented empire seen as the Islamic Empire. That's how they saw themselves, and that's how they projected it. The leader of the Ottoman Empire was the caliph, uh, the leader of the Islamic State, and the, not in the sense of the modern Islamic State folks claim that they are, but that was what uh, that was how they were talking about it. That changed when we got to Turkey, and they become much more secular. They set aside most of their religious stuff in terms of government in a very active sense, which we'll talk about in a bit. But World War I, side of the Central Powers, lose really bad. Second thing is one of the things that happens during World War I that bears mentioning, though it doesn't directly affect a lot of Turkish politics internally, and that's what we put called the Armenian Genocide. Um, especially if you live near the Watertown area, which is where I lived for quite a while, it has one of the largest concentrations of Armenians in the United States. Uh, the short version of what happened here is, let me go back to maps for a sec. So if you look at the map here, the territory in this area is where Armenia is. <coughs> If Russia is your enemy during the war, and you're here, you might be kind of concerned about the people who are there. Uh, and that's part of what happened in terms of the Ottoman Empire. They were concerned about Armenians who were part of their country. There were a number of racist ideas that viewed them as sneaky or untrustworthy, like most racist ideas have little, if any, better, uh, grounding in fact. But partially because of that, they culled most of the men uh, from uh, the Armenian population. In the Ottoman Empire, they forced them into the military and then put them to work doing forced labor and didn't really feed them much at all, and most of them died of exposure. In some instances, they straight up took machine guns and murdered them. Uh, women and children, they largely had marched south, and the march itself killed the vast majority of them. It was particularly brutal. One reason that it's particularly relevant to understanding Turkey now is Turkey has spent a lot of effort creating a history for itself in a certain <laughs> way. Every country does this, to, to one degree or another. But Turkey was trying to create a very strong break from what the Ottoman Empire was, especially well, for a bunch of different reasons. But in creating that break, they make an effort to emphasize good parts of their history and de emphasize bad parts. Think about the US. We do very similar stuff. When we talk about the founders, we acknowledge that, yes, slavery was a thing, but most of them totally hated it. We don't mention that George Washington owned slaves most of the times so that we talk about it. He totally did. He set them free after he died. We thought he owned slaves for his whole life. I mean, dude. Uh, yeah, so in this way, I think all countries have a degree of revisionism to their history. But Turkey, especially because they're trying to create this new nation that is not the Ottoman Empire reborn, but a new country, they're very actively trying to distance themselves from the bad acts that the Ottoman Empire did, and trying to say, that wasn't us, that was those other guys. Make sense? Even if a lot of people involved were the same, we were not those people. The Armenian Genocide is something that is so horrific, though, that they can't just say, it wasn't us. They go a step further and say it didn't. Uh, that maybe some things happened, but it certainly wasn't an organized campaign uh, of, of ethnic cleansing or genocide. Absolutely wasn't. And the, the Armenians who survived were like, yeah, it, it was. Um, I know it was there. It really was. Most of the rest of the world acknowledges that it was. Uh, the United States has historically waffled on that issue, largely because we want Turkey as an ally, and Turkey has been very adamant that they will be really, really pissed at us if we acknowledge that it exists. In the same way that if you, you think back to uh, China, uh, China and Taiwan, uh, bit of a tangent here, but Taiwan though, is where people fled from China to sort of government in exile during uh, Mao's revolution. For a long time, uh, we did not acknowledge mainland China as China. It was called a one China policy, we sort of flipped it later. But any time the US officially acknowledges Taiwan, China gets really angry about it. So like, that's not a separate country. That's our country. We just don't happen to be in control of it right now. But don't talk about that. It's still technically our country. 
Uh, so, in a similar sort of way, Turkey's like, it definitely didn't happen, and don't you dare remind us that it might happen, or we're going to be really angry about it. Uh, so it's one of the bigger diplomatic faux pas that one might create, unless we have the goal of trying to force them to reconcile and make up for, or in some way, deal with it. So far, we've decided that the political benefits of having Turkey like us are more significant than either the political benefits of having the Armenians like us or the moral necessity of acknowledging and combating genocide. And that's a political calculation that we can argue people should do differently, but thus far they have not. Third, in terms of founding history. So, end of World War I, Ottoman Empire gets broken up. You get a group of people, uh, they call themselves the Young Turks. You may have heard there's a modern uh, news podcast group that identifies themselves the same way, and an interesting reference back in history. But you have a bunch of Turkish nationalists who take power there. They, the Ottoman Empire was still technically in charge of the area of Turkey. So going back here, they shrunk down to here, but it was still technically the Ottoman Empire at that point. It was just a tiny Ottoman Empire. These Turkish nationalists are like, well, we don't want an empire. We don't, we're not interested in conquering and expanding and taking all this territory. We think that there is something inherent to being Turkish and being part of this Turkish state that is important, and that's what we want. So you imperial people, get out. You're not in charge anymore. We are. We are making this a new country, a country of our own. And so they begin the modern Turkish era. And this guy, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, is probably the single most important person to know about in Turkish history. Here he is, looking snazzy. That's a technical term. Uh, he's a, an amazingly big deal in Turkey. You think George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Hamilton all rolled into one. Uh, this guy defines what it is to be Turkish uh, for most people who are there. Uh, he's very much the father of the nation, uh, not necessarily deified, but dang close to it. Uh, and he functions, uh, one of the ways he, he's been described is. He was a dictator in Turkey to make certain Turkey would never need to have a dictator after he was done. Uh, so consolidated a ton of power, used it to shape a republic that would then work independently once he was gone. And for the most part, at least early on, he succeeded fairly well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about details in a bit. Yeah? Is there any significance to how the name changed from the Ottoman Empire to Turkey? Yes. And part of that is that actually gets into founding principles. So you're a half step ahead of me. Well done. Uh, part of it was a desire to step away from imperialism and expansionism. Empire is all about conquering tons of territory and ruling massive parts of the world. Not what Turkey wanted. Uh, they wanted to distance themselves from that legacy, and they wanted to be focused more on being a nation of Turks. Rather than an empire that conquers all different kinds of people and tries to rule them all, we are united by the fact that we all live in this place and agree with these general cultural ideas. That was very much the focus that they wanted to have. And that gets into one or two of the different founding principles that we'll talk about here. So there are six of these, great question, by the way. There are six of these. Uh, they're referred to as Kemalism. Again, uh, Mustafa Kemal, Ataturk, or Ataturkism. They were principles that he laid down uh, and that Turkey has largely stuck with for almost 100 years. Uh, when he set these up, he actually set the military up as the guarantors of these freedoms. He was a, he was a military general. He was very impressive did great things in keeping Turkey independent from the Turkish perspective. So he said to the military, you're not going to be politicians, but if Turkey ever drifts too far from these principles, your job is to step in and bring them back there, because you're the only ones who have the power and the force to actually do it. As a result, the military has actually done that a number of times throughout Turkey's history. We'll talk about those in detail when we get to modern history. But let's lay out the principles. First is republicanism. Turkey, as it is conceived by Ataturk, uh, Ataturk incidentally means father of Turks. It's a name he was given after he assumed this sort of role, and that's why he's spoken of in that way. Mustafa, uh, Mustafa Kamal uh, is his given name, but Ataturk is how he's always referred to since then. Uh, first is republicanism. The Turkey is not a monarchy, it is not a caliphate, it is not a dictatorship, it is not an empire, an imperial thing, it is Roman, <coughs> which means there is no monarchy part of what distinguishes it from the Ottoman Empire. We're not, I'm not claiming to be the new king. There is no king. We are an entirely separate thing, is the idea. But in addition to that, Turkey is a representative democracy, one of the first in the region. Uh, and they've maintained that, for the most part, pretty well. Um, for a long time, the US at least talked about Turkey as the only Western democracy in the Middle East, except for Israel. Uh, and that there's arguments we made about that statement, but that, that was at least the perception that we had in how we talked about it. So, republicanism, no monarchy, people elect, that's important, that's your matter. 
and they are the ones who we listen to. Second is populism. Now, this term gets, we talk about it in a lot of different ways. Like in the US, I expect you've heard populism thrown around this concept. What do you all think of when you hear that? Like if someone talks about someone's got a very populist message, not a popular message, that's different, but a populist message. What do you think? Something trending on Facebook or? That's more the popular <laughs> one. Yeah. Think populist, yeah. Appeals to the people? Yeah, it's focused on the average ordinary person. A lot of populism is about being anti-elite. Uh, this is something that the modern Republican Party has, at least under Trump in particular, has tried to channel to a large degree, rhetorically at least. It's something that historically the Democrats, uh, if you go back to William Jennings Bryan, had a huge thing with. Uh, so from time to time in American history, populism rises up as a political phenomenon where people say, those elites in Washington are terrible, we need to have just the average farmer making our rules again. Like, I trust that I, I trust Joe and Jane down the street more than I trust some e egghead with a PhD who thinks he knows what's best. That's kind of the essence of populism, is that the elites are not the ones who should be in charge. It should be normal, average, everyday people. Or in the 1890s, I mean, it was uprising against Wall Street. Yep, yep. And the railroads and the trusts yep. and the big corporations. Exactly. Populism can be very much an economic force. It usually happens when you have a fairly wide, rich, poor gap and the poor feel like they're being massively exploited by the elite, they tend to band together and say, knock that off, put us in charge, and then that happens, and then those people become the elite, and the cycle repeats, you know, every <laughs> generation or two. Uh, but populism here, the key thing is rule by the common people. So you don't have some collection of people in a smoky back room who get to make the decisions, uh, decide like, who's on the ballot and all that stuff. The people are the ones who should be, be making the decisions, and in particular, the needs of the common citizen are what matters. We'll get into the next point in a sec, which is secularism. Turkey is not an officially religious state, but they provided and created the state government of Turkey, created a Turkish translation of the Quran, which is tremendously unusual. Uh, officially speaking, from a strict perspective, the Quran is only the Quran in Arabic. Even more specifically, it is only the Quran when it is spoken in Arabic, because that's how it was first received. Uh, part of that, we're going to detour real briefly to some Islamic concepts for a second, but the Islamic story, at least a part of it, is that Muhammad was visited by the Archangel Gabriel, who spoke, God spoke to Gabriel, Gabriel spoke to Muhammad, and said, there are mistakes that have been made in the Bible, here are the corrections, and here is the version that we should get down, make sure this doesn't get messed up. That's a tremendously oversimplified version, but that's kind of the initial chain of transmission. Yeah? So the Quran, as I understand, is actually considered a holy book. Absolutely. It is, you could consider it the updated word of God, if you want, at least from the Islamic perspective. In the same way that Christians look at the New Testament compared to the Old Testament, when there's a conflict between the two, they tend to prefer the New Testament over the Old, right? Old Testament is much more God smiting stuff. New Testament is much more Jesus, peace, love, and hippies, depending on the interpretation you like. Uh, but when those things conflict, they prefer the new. Muslims view the Bible as significant. They view it as a holy text, but they think that there are errors that have crept in as it's been retranslated, as it's been retold over the years, and their, their argument is that God realized that was a problem, and so he gave Muhammad the corrections to those. The Quran is both the collection of corrections, but also the correct stories, the stuff that either has been lost or has been misunderstood or mistranslated or passed down incorrectly. And because of that, there's a very large focus in Islam on accuracy and fidelity of translation memorizing exact passages exactly as they are written in the language they are written is really important because they don't want the same things that happened before to happen again. Uh, they don't want us to screw up the translation or write things down or remember them wrong and allow errors to creep in. So their argument is it's really important to keep it as close to the original as possible and there are versions, especially nowadays, that are translated into English and other languages, but especially back in the 1920s, that was not a thing that happened. Uh, in the same way that, like, think about the Catholic Church having masses in Latin before Vatican II. Uh, if that's something that you all might be familiar with, right? For a long time, priests faced away from the congregation, said mass in Latin toward the altar. Congregation, you were supposed to be there and supposed to, like, be vener like, venerate God and stuff, but you weren't supposed to actually understand stuff. You were supposed to talk to the priest, and the priest could explain it to you, but you didn't need to actually be able to read the text. The priest was the conduit for religion. This understanding, and that, that's part of why it was written, and part of why they kept it in Latin and didn't write translations for a long time that the average person who didn't speak Latin could read. In a similar sort of way, 
the Turks and, and, and Turkey said that if we care about what the average people know and understand, we should make even religious things accessible to them, not make them go through a scholar or uh, some elite person within the religion to explain what it is. They should be able to read it themselves and know what it means. And this is something that a more fundamentalist views of Islam would be very much opposed to. So, just as a way to recognize how <coughs> focused on populism they were and how willing they were to defy religious conventions, there was, like, Turkey is a fundamentally secular state. It is not a religious state. And they were willing to do things like this because they believed it was important for the common people to know instead of having to rely on an elite person to translate it for them. Does that make sense? The distinction there? Cool. That gets us to the third point, which is secularism. And in a lot of ways, this is one, well, all of these are really important, but this is one we focus on a lot because it's particularly unusual in the region. In a lot of areas in the Middle East, the governments end up being very strongly religious, partially because the people there tend to be fairly strongly religious, and that's a unifying concept. And there's a much, much larger discussion that we can have about how most of the countries in that region were created, which is generally, uh, you're going to get the, the two-minute uh, cartoon version of it. So Europe looks over the Middle East and says, you know what, you got stuff. We want that stuff. We've got guns. Give us that stuff. And I'm going to take this part, and so going back to our Ottoman Empire map. Da, 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 da. So France comes in and says, I'm going to take this part. Britain's like, I'm going to take this part. Uh, Belgium's like, I'm going to take this part. France's like, oh, I want this part too. Uh, and then you start carving up the entire region. Notice how straight a lot of these lines are? That's because they're not decided based on rivers or natural inclinations. They're not decided based on where different groups of people or ethnic groups are. They are divided up based on lines drawn on a map by colonial powers who wanted specific natural resources as theirs. Africa looks very much the same. If you look at Europe, very few straight lines, because by and large, Europe was set up in terms of boundaries, partially by conquest, but partially by ethnic groups, and by people who identified as being the same, sharing a language, sharing culture. And the, in those instances, natural boundaries like rivers, coasts, mountain ranges are much more likely what you will find. Any part of the world where you see a ton of straight border lines, it is a virtual guarantee that an external colonial power came in, carved up the territory to suit their needs with no regard for what happened to the indigenous people. And that's a lot of why both Africa and the Middle East have massive problems with governance compared to what you might see other places, is because we took groups that had nothing in common and in some cases despised one another, put them in the same place, and put someone from one of those two groups in charge and just hoped everyone would be fine with it. Which, surprisingly, didn't work out so well. Uh, so what happens, we get tons of different territorial bits carved out here. And that gets us back to oh, the secular thing. One of the reasons why a lot of the nations in the Middle East identify with a more strongly religious basis is that's something that unites people of different ethnicities in that area. They share a religion even if they don't share a culture and even if they don't share a language. So that becomes the thing that they can build a government around that they all have in common. Because by artificially dividing the countries via colonialism, we've denied them anything else. Turkey is somewhat unique in that it specifically avoided that particular issue. Uh, partially that's because Ataturk was strongly influenced by some of what was happening in Europe, uh, in France in particular. He was very inspired by the French system, and a number of things here reflect how France deals with religion in particular. But he wanted a state that would be identified by the people there, not by the religion that they had. The fact that you grew up and lived in Turkey and had shared the customs and culture of Turkey, that is what made you Turkish, not the religion that you had. Yeah, please. Because most of the people there were Islam, or Muslim. They were, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, they, so they, they did yeah. validate that. Absolutely. Okay. Turkey's population, uh, I, I, do, I actually want to look up the stat here. I forgot. The majority is Islam, uh, mm -hmm. by actually a fairly wide margin. Okay. Uh, it's, the difference is that they're Muslims, but they don't, generally speaking, have a government that is Muslim. Uh, in the same way that, at least in theory, the United States doesn't have a government that's Christian, even though the largest chunk of people in the US are Christian. Great question again. So, secularism, first thing they did, this is huge, they abolished the caliphate. Remember, the caliphate back in the Ottoman Empire, uh, the caliphate is the idea that uh, there is an Islamic empire, uh, that Islam as a, as a religion should control a portion of territory. The same way the Holy Roman Empire was like, Christians should control a whole portion of territory and rule over it in the name of God. 
Same idea with the Ottoman Empire uh, at their peak, that we are a Muslim empire and we'll rule over a whole bunch of territory and bring God to these people. Uh, the Caliph was the leader of that. They were not just a person who had power, they were much more akin to the Pope than anything else. Think of it as the Islamic Pope, but you're in the right general ballpark. It's not identical to close. So the leader of the Ottoman Empire was the Caliph, historically, and had been since the 1400s when the empire really took off. So when Turkey, when that area was converted to being Turkey instead of the Ottoman Empire, one of the first things they did is said, there is no caliph anymore. This is not an Islamic empire. We don't claim that our leader speaks for a religion, and they are the leader of men, not a leader of God. Uh, which was a huge change at the time. I, and think about it from their perspective. Like, there's a ton of power that you have over all kinds of other countries around you if they share that religion, and you basically have the Pope of that religion as your president. Right? That's a lot of potential influence that they decided to set aside because they thought it would make for a better state and make for a more equal, better place. Uh, which is, in my opinion, one of the more surprising uh, decisions in modern history in the region. Second, for them, religion is largely a private affair. Yeah, let me read the Sultan? Uh, the Sultan and the Caliph were largely the same individual. Were they executed? I actually don't know offhand. They were either executed or exiled. Um, but I'm not positive. That's actually a great question that I do, I'll honestly tell you, I don't have the answer. But the Googles know. <laughs> so feel free to Google and let me know what you find. Uh, but for them, religion was a private affair, not a government issue. They have no problem with people being religious. They just don't want the government making religious decisions or making decisions based on religious grounds. If your religion teaches you to, be, to do these sorts of things to people, they're fine making laws based on that. But they want to make those laws because it is good for the country, not because God says so. Make sense? Again, similar to uh, some versions of the US, very similar to the way that France looks at it. They are very aggressively neutral toward religion, which is a weird phrase and one that I like for that reason, being aggressively neutral. Uh, they actively try to prevent any religious perspective from having a significant influence in government. Uh, as opposed to the US, where we're like, uh, you know, if you, you, you probably you're going to swear on a Bible when you get sworn into office. And realistically, if you're not a Christian, a Jew, or, or a Muslim, your chances, and that last one very unlikely, your chances of holding elected office at a national level are basically zero. Uh, that's not necessarily the case in Turkey. Yeah? Uh, are they, but are they uh, mostly Shia or Sunni? Mostly Sunni. Sunni. Yep. Uh, the only really great question as well, one of the, there are only a few countries in the region that are actually Shia dominated. Iran is one, Iraq is the other. Uh, in Iraq, it's uh, the plurality of the population, but it's not an overwhelming majority. Uh, one of the other ones, uh, Syria, is governed by the, Alawite, uh, by the Alawites, of which Bashar al-Assad is one. They're a subset of Shia Islam. Uh, think of them a little like most Christians think of Mormons, in that Mormons say, we're totally Christian. And a lot of Christians are like, you're very different than us. I don't know if that technically counts as being Christian the way I think of being Christian. But if you ask Mormons, they absolutely are. If you ask an Alawite, they're like, we're absolutely Shiite Islam. And if you ask most Shiites, they're, well, you're very different than what I am. Same kind of thing. So technically, they fit in that overall, uh, overall area there in Syria. But everywhere except for those places, with a few exceptions, is Sunni dominated. Sunnis are about 70 to 80% of the Muslim world. Um, actually, a little more. So, You've got an aggressively secular model where, like France, things that are very overt symbols of religion that are trying that people try to introduce into the public sphere, they tend to act against. Like in the US, you can set up a nativity scene on public property. Like the Supreme Court has upheld that that is a legitimate thing that, that people can do if they want. They would not permit something parallel to that, uh, whether it's Islamic, Christian, or whatever, in Turkey or in France. Because they would see that as the government providing endorsement or support for religion, and they want to keep religion out of the government and out of the public sphere as much as possible. Have your churches, have your mosques, have your homes, pray and do all of your things there, that's totally fine. But don't try to make the public sector that. Uh, there's actually been some going back and forth on head coverings and dress. Initially, they banned headscarves for women. Uh, and that's something that more recently has flipped the other way for a long time. That was a very overt religious covering, and they didn't want that massive symbol of sectarianism to be present in the public sphere. Similarly, the Fez, I don't know if you all have seen Fez's, if you're a Doctor Who fan, uh, the, I think it's the 10th Doctor, <laughs> no, the 11th Doctor, one of them, uh, Adam Smith, or Matt Smith. Uh, Adam Smith is somebody else, Invisible Hand, Catholicism. But uh, yeah, the Fez was a traditional Turkish thing, uh, or at least Ottoman thing, that out of Turkey got rid of, he banned it. Because he said, that's what we used to be, that was the Ottoman thing, we are not that anymore, it's gone. 
So symbols of things that are not Turkish, uh, there's generally a fairly strong animus towards uh, religion being the big area there. Three other principles that are central. Fourth one is reformism. This, I think, is actually really interesting. So in the United States, uh, I'm going to make a bit of a parallel to Supreme Court stuff, which especially with Kavanaugh's confirmation is in the news more than usual these days. You have a bunch of different theories about how to interpret the Constitution, right? The two big ones are you have what are called strict constructionists or originalists who say that if you look at the Constitution, you should think about how the people who wrote it would have intended it, right? The meaning of the document and how we should interpret it is based on what the founders wanted it to be. And we should have our government and our society as close to what they wanted as possible. That's the originalist or strict constructionist, more conservative interpretation. The more liberal interpretation says, Constitution is a living document. People in the 1700s could not have predicted the internet and the privacy concerns that come with that, or even freaking cars. So we have to have it adapt as our society adapts and changes. We have to use the founding principles there, the basic ideas that they've outlined, and have them modernized for today's society and consider them within the context that we live in now. You follow the two big philosophies there? In this sense, in America, generally speaking, the strict constructionist view, the we should do it the way the founders wanted, is the one that has the largest, at least in the current Supreme Court, that's the largest makeup. In Turkey, they would be very much opposed to that view. The idea of reformism is that reforms don't stop with attitude. He created an excellent starting point, but that there should always be reformation. Things should always improve. We should always strive to be more modern. Just because he came up with it then and it's worked for a while doesn't mean it should still work in the future. As long as we hold to these founding principles, the other details are things that we should constantly try to update. They amend their constitution much more frequently than a lot of other places do. They make changes like that in the name of moving forward. So there's uh, tradition, while it's respected, is not uh, the end-all, be-all, but it may be other places, even places like the United States, where we tend to think of ourselves as more progressive than other parts of the world. We are oftentimes pulled back by a, a veneration of our founding fathers and a desire, a desire to try to line up with what they intended. We can argue whether that's good or bad, but we definitely do that. The Turks, while they venerate Ataturk, one of the principles that he himself enshrined was there's always reformation and there's always reform going on. Don't fight against a modernizing idea just because we haven't done it before. And so reform is continual, it doesn't stop with him, always try to be more modern. He was very against things that he viewed as backwards or regressing in society. Nationalism is the fifth, the fifth of the various ideals. And that's the idea that everyone, if you're a citizen of Turkey, you're a Turk. Regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of what you look like, regardless of your gender, regardless of your parents were, if you're a citizen of Turkey, you're a Turk. And that's the identity is not based on appearance, and it isn't based on even what tribal group your ancestors may have been part of. None of that matters. As soon as you're a citizen of Turkey, you are a Turk. And the nation, and that concept of the Turkish nation, is what matters. And part of that also is wrapped in with the idea of anti-imperialism, that we don't want to go conquer other areas, because Though those people are not Turks, we shouldn't make them live under Turkish law. We shouldn't try to expand Turkey to other places. We are what we are, and that's it. One other thing that's interesting is you will not find hyphenated identities. Like Asian American, African American is very common here. You cannot be an African Turk or an Asian Turk. You're a Turk or you're not. Uh, and regardless of where you're born or what you look like, if you're a citizen of Turkey, you are a Turk. This is one of the major flashpoint issues with the group we're going to talk about called the Kurds. Uh, they are an ethnic group that spans a bunch of different countries in the region. Actually, our next big chunk is going into what's up with them. They span a bunch of different group area, a bunch of different countries in the region, and they have a very distinct identity and culture of their own. And Turkey's like, no, no, no you can't have that. You should be Turkish. They're like, but we're Kurds. Like, this is who we are. This is what my father's 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 grandfather's great uncle's niece's father did that this, this matters to me, this is central to my identity. I want to teach people the Kurdish language. I want to, teach, I want, I want to have broadcasts in Kurdish so my kids don't lose that cultural history. And Turkey goes, no, you're a Turk. If you're a, if you're a Turkish citizen, you're a Turk. You don't get the option to be a, not a Turk and still be a Turkish citizen. We are one nation, not a nation of multiple ethnicities. Uh, which to me, again, is a really interesting conflict because in some ways I find this idea very inspiring that we look past any physical differentiations of people 
But on the flip side, it also means that they end up often suppressing cultures that might otherwise be part of it. It's intended to be a much more uniform society, less of the sort of tossed salad or mixed or helping pot sort of thing that we have here. Yes, please. Um, this all sounds wonderful in terms of the idealistic background yeah. of it. But Ataturk killed an awful lot of people. There's a lot of blood there Absolutely. that did not agree with his religious and national beliefs and the whole system. Yeah. So if you didn't go with a piece of that, you were dead. Yeah. And that needs to be said. I would agree. And this because is part this is of, very yeah. idealistic and wonderful, yeah. but that's not yeah. exactly how it is. This is not the whole story by any means. This is much more of the vision of what was wanted. How we got to that vision was a lot bloodier and a lot more oppressive. This goes back to Ataturk was a dictator. Like, and he did the bad things that dictators do. He did it with the intention that that would then not be necessary in the future. This is that intention, but still, the road to hell and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still going on now. And that's so what we're going to talk about. The intention for the future. Yep, we're, that's the last part of the presentation. You're, you're also going where I'm going, just a little bit faster than me. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. almost slow today, y'all, forgive me. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's easy to gloss over a lot of the, fa a lot of the problems <coughs> that got us here. It's easy to look at the high ideals and forget how much blood and carnage was slogged through in order to get there. There is a reason why Turkey wants to erase the Armenian genocide from history, because that's another thing that was part of what facilitated this. It's a lot easier to say there are different ethnic groups in our country when you exterminate one. <laughs> so. Yes? I'm, I'm curious about a small part sure. of that. Please. You talked about the Fez. Yeah. Never mind the head covering. Just, I think there's still that there. If you go to maybe to parts of Turkey, maybe that's not the city, yeah. you know, that centralized part. Mm -hmm. That's part oh, yeah. of the being, the part of the identity. Absolutely. You know. And this effort is, anytime you're trying to have the government assert a, a cultural program, it almost always is much more effective in urban centers and in cities than it is in rural areas. We've seen that in the United States, we've seen that in Iraq, we've seen that in Syria and Afghanistan. Governments almost always have much better control in the cities than they do in rural areas. So even though the highlights of this you would see if you went to Istanbul, you're not going to see them anywhere near, near, near as much in village number 37. Very true. Let's get to the last issue, just statism. Uh, similar to nationalism, but has a very distinct thing here. This also gets more into the, the bloody dictator sort of thing. And that's that the government has the right and duty to control whatever it needs to in order to make things work. So specifically, economic functions. The government can just straight up take over business and say that's ours now because it is too foundational to society to leave it in the hands of private individuals. This can be used benevolently, it can also be used very maliciously. There's a recent example where Turkey's largest newspaper printed some things that were critical of its current leader, so he took over the newspaper and made it a government asset instead of a private company. There are problems that come with this model. On the flip side, it also means that you can do centralized planning for your economy, which is something that China has benefited from significantly, and then they moved a little bit away from, but being able to determine as a nation, over the next 15 years, what are we going to need to be able to produce? Uh, what kinds of transportation things do we need? And then designing and requiring businesses to do those things can be really, really efficient. But it comes with a lot of sizable downsides, too. This is more the authoritarian bent, but at least arguably authoritarianism for beneficial social needs. This does generally lead to state control, in particular of being economic interests. Any questions on the six principles here? Reformism, nationalism, statism, that at the top we've got, let's go back to them. Republicanism, popularism, and secularism. Remember, the army is set up as the guarantor of these things. If politicians mess it up, Ataturk says to the military, because again, his approach was very militaristic, he says to the military, it is your job to step in and fix it. So, well, let's talk about these fine folks. <laughs> This map, I look for a couple different maps, and this one actually works fairly well, it's a volt. Uh, it's the lighter area here, that's all area inhabited by the Kurds. Note the boundary of Turkey, you know the boundary of Syria, of Iraq, of Iran. Kurds cross all of that area. The Kurdish people basically didn't get a state. When the colonial powers carved up the Middle East, they didn't care enough about that territory. Like, because they didn't care about ethnic groups when they made the distinction, they just carved up, like, France said, I want this chunk of territory, so they took it. Um, 
Britain, Britain said, we want this chunk of territory, so they took it. Which means you have an entire ethnic group of people that share common language, common history, common culture, or a minority in every country they live in, and have no political power anywhere. That kind of sets a recipe for some problems. Uh, and while they have reacted in sometimes more peaceful and sometimes more violent ways, it's definitely not a setup that you would like to mirror if you can avoid it. A huge chunk, if you've been following any of what's happened in the Syrian civil war, or what's going on against ISIS, and Iraq ISIS incidentally, is largely, they were central, centralized in this area, to Mosul, uh, after a while. In Miro, uh, they threatened for a bit. They never got as far down as kind of it really effectively. But this area is largely where ISIS was trying to carve out territory. Uh, and the Kurds were kicking their butts. Uh, the Kurds, more so than any other group, have had to work together. They have formed militias to protect themselves because each of, in effect, each of these various countries at different times have decided the Kurds are getting too uppity. They might try to declare independence. We can't have that, so they've come in and crushed them. Uh, and the Kurds have gotten fairly good at fighting back. Yeah? But then on the other hand, the Kurds are one of our strongest allies. Yep, that is a huge tension with Turkey. Because if you know, the biggest chunk of Kurds are in Turkey compared to any of these countries. There's a substantial portion in the other ones, but by far the largest of them, are, the largest group of them are huge. Uh, and it's an area also that's proximate to most of the Eastern Europe areas that Turkey may want to be connected with in terms of oil fields. Also, a lot of natural gas resources, more down here than up here. Turkey doesn't have massive uh, gas and, and oil reserves, but they do have some. And so. The concern for most of these groups, Iran largely has been fairly hands off of the Kurds. Of all of these different states, they have been the less an least antagonistic toward them. Uh, things have largely just worked out there for the most part because they haven't tried to, they haven't been too worried about them breaking away, partially because they're on the border of Iraq here, which Iran has been at war with at different times. So they don't mind, remember, Shiite, Sunni, uh, at least in terms of government control up until recently. Uh, so they haven't minded having these folks as a buffer. Basically, if Iraq marches into Iran, the first people get killed are the Kurds, which, if you're Persian, might not be as big an issue for you as if the first people were Persian. Yeah? Does, the, does Turkey consider the Kurds Turkish? Great but, question. But the Kurds don't consider themselves Turkish? It's back and forth. Um, the official stance is very, very Turkey. Uh, technically, if you're a citizen of Turkey, you are a Turk, and that is all you can be. Uh, the Kurds very much object to that, and as a practical matter, Turkey tends to, to talk about them as if they're an identified group separate from being Turkish citizens, but as an ideological point, they would say technically they are Turks, or at least they should be. Yeah? Can you say more about the Kurds? Absolutely. So, one second. Essential fuels, water and caffeine. Between the two of them, I'll stay up here. So, uh, basic, basic things to know about the Kurds and about what's going on with them. So they've become fairly self-sufficient in a lot of areas. If you look actually up here in Iraq, the Kurdish area of Iraq is semi-independent. They rule themselves by and large. The Senate, when Saddam Hussein was in power, he made a point. Uh, like if you ever you hear about Saddam Hussein gassing his own people, that was a refrain you heard a lot in the war. These were the folks that he used uh, chemical weapons on, chemical weapons that we sold him. But that's beside the point. Um, that was back when Iran, when Iraq was our ally against Iran back in the day, and during the Iran-Iraq War, we wanted to arm Iraq with chemical weapons to use against the Iranians. Uh, so we gave Iraq chemical weapons, and he used some of them there, but he used a lot more of them on his own people here. And now we, and then we got really mad at him later on when it was convenient. But the area here, these Kurds largely control their control how things work for them. They maintain their own culture. They're generally pretty peacefully well organized. Like the trash gets picked up on time in Kurdish territory by. Uh, up in Turkey, there have been a lot of issues. There's a group called the PKK, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, it's the Kurdish Workers' Party, uh, is the translation for it, uh, even though that doesn't line up with the acronym, because the acronym's for Turkish words, not English. Uh, the PKK is an active resistance group in Turkey. They're Kurds who say, we need our own state, and it should be right here. Sorry, Turkey, this should be ours now. Get out. Uh, we should be able to rule ourselves. Hmm? Well, then the people go to and the other thing is the PKK has engaged in terrorist tactics over time. Uh, they've blown up a number of different places. Uh, they've been less violent in the last decade or two, but especially in the late 90s and early 80s, uh, the PKK was very active as a terrorist group. And thus, Turkey was super concerned about them and made a point of cracking down on them with a lot of regularity. 
But one of the problems is, because all of this area is Kurdish, and because it's really tough to set up really uh, regulated and well-established like, checkpoints and rule of law in an area where the population doesn't want you there, these borders are really easy to get through. Which means, if you're a PKK cell, you blow up something over here, and then instead of fleeing here, you just go down here. Or you go over here. And now it's an international incident if the government wants to come after you. Uh, which is part of why Turkey, and again we'll get to this and more recent stuff, but Turkey has taken a number of opportunities to do cross-border strikes both into Iraq and Syria to hit Kurdish groups there. Turkey is also very, very concerned about the U.S. working with the Kurds and using them as an ally because they're really worried that if the U.S. ever formally supports a Turkish state, it's going to be chaos. Uh, and Turkey is terrified of that possibility because then they lose this entire chunk of territory, uh, which loses them direct access to Iran or Iraq, loses them potentially access to Armenia, which is essential to getting through the Caspian Sea uh, via Azerbaijan, also getting through uh, Georgia, which Tbilisi here is where a major pipeline from Russian oil and natural gas runs. If they lose Kurdish territory, from their perspective, is a massive threat to their territorial integrity. Yeah. Are there any Kurdish representatives in the Turkish government? Great question. Yes. Uh, recently, though. That's a fairly recent development is in, within the last few decades. Uh, but yes, we're going to get there in a sec. Because there have been divisions within the Kurds as to whether it is better for us to play within the system or to attack the system. And <coughs> where we're at now, the PKK is a, a very small minority of the Kurds. The vast majority of them are peaceful and are engaged politically. But there are these radical groups that are out there. Think of it kind of similar, similarly to the way you think of environmentalists. There are some environmentalists in the US who like blow up logging camps and stuff, but they're really the minority. Most are like Sierra Club Greenpeace people. Well, Greenpeace kind of goes out in the edge sometimes, but like most are just people who want to like hike in the redwoods and stuff. But there are some who kind of go overboard. Similar sort of thing might be said of the Kurdish folk. The vast majority of them, especially now, this has gone up and down at different times. The vast majority want to try to work with the system if they can, and they've, got, they've had some success there. Like Turkish language, some of the restrictions on it have been lifted. Turkey, uh, Kurdish broadcasting, for a long time, uh, it was prohibited to broadcast any programs in, in the Kurdish language. Uh, and some of those restrictions have been lifted, largely because Turkey is interested in joining the EU. Uh, and the EU is like, no, no, you really shouldn't like stop people's free speech and stuff. That's like a thing that we're about, you know? So, like, uh, and Turkey has started making some concessions in that direction. Uh, did you still have a question, Ben? I was just going to say that when you talk about little splinter groups yeah. that cause problems, yeah. many countries in Europe have had splinter oh, yes. groups of their own. It's not just, and I'm not I talking mean, about you know the the terrorists, the yeah. high level, but the smaller splinter groups. Most countries. Oh have yeah, the Basque region. Country. You can look at the folks uh, in. Uh, Catalonia and Spain as well. Most, yeah, you'll find them all over the place, but part of one of the big differences is just how large the territory this group claims is and the fact that they're inter uh, they're international, um, that they cross multiple national boundaries. Uh, and the fact that realistically, because remember, all of these lines are super artificial, they have a pretty good claim that they should have gotten a state, uh, they should have gotten a nation of their own. If anyone's seen Lawrence of Arabia, Peter O'Toole, classic, right? Based on a real person, T.H. Lawrence, uh, who was a British person who spent a bunch of time uh, in the Middle East, he actually drew up a map of how he thought it should be divided. And those divisions were almost entirely based on ethnic groups. He carved out a separate area for the Palestinians, separate from some of the areas that, that it looked like uh, the Jewish folk were going to want. He carved out a specific state for the Kurds. It was entirely differently designed. But he acknowledged this is a group that exists and has an identity and should have their own. So this, I think, is one of the enduring problems that probably will not go away in the near future. The Syrian civil war has significantly exacerbated it, as has the issues with ISIS and Iraq. Us going into Iraq initially, uh, Desert Storm wasn't a huge issue, but going the second time we overthrew the government, this again functionally became a 70% independent state. And so they're, if they're able to continue fighting effectively and continue gaining international respect, the more legitimate they seem, the more scared Turkey gets. Uh, and because Turkey and Iran are sort of at odds with one another in a bunch of different ways, the happier Iran is to have the Kurds get their own, get their own uh, recognition because these folk aren't usually a problem here. These folk are a much bigger problem for Turkey than they are for Iran. Uh, you get a lot of regional antagonism. Syria, by and large, is now a proxy battle. Iran on one end, Russia 
which is opposed to Turkey, because Turkey's in NATO, on the other end, and part of why Iran wants Syria to hold fast, is if its, its government collapses, then they have all kinds of other problems. So, big mess. I want to move on, but I'll get to other questions. Oh, go ahead, real quick. Yeah. Why is the US ally in the Kurds? Because they're the only ones who don't suck. Uh, in the to put, not to put too fine a point on that, that's, that's hyperbole. Uh, from a fighting perspective, they are the most unified, they are the most cohesive, and they have been the most successful against ISIS compared to any other group. Uh, a lot of that is because they've trained to fight against actual militaries like Turkey and like Iraq, like Iraq's military. And they have a lot much closer bonds as a community. They're used to working together. Unlike the Iraqi military, which generally hasn't been paid, is generally really poorly disciplined, doesn't always trust the people they're working with, the Kurds are much more unified. So because they're effective at fighting someone we really don't like, we have helped them out. And do we supply them as military Yes and no. Uh, that policy fluctuates, uh, depending on the day and the mood and the person in charge. Question? Another question? Yeah. Yes. Yep. And that's a lot of what makes this, like realistically, if there's going to be a Kurdish state, it will probably look something like this chunk of Iraq, probably that chunk there, including the bomb, uh, maybe all the way over to uh, in Turkey, and probably this uh, northern chunk of Syria. Uh, there's a whole separate issue that we, we won't have time to get into, and that's if you look at the Tigris and Euphrates rivers here, both of those, the headwaters, flow from Turkey. Uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, probably the single most important issue in this region is going to be control of the water sources for those two, uh, those two rivers. And Turkey has both of them. Uh, they are building hundreds of dams on those rivers, and they have no formal agreements with Syria or Iraq about who has rights to any of the water downstream. Turkey doesn't have much in terms of oil and natural gas, but what it has is water. As the population there expands, right now Iraq's population is projected to almost double by 2050 compared to what it was at the start of the, 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 start of the millennium and the start of the century. Uh, that well, water resources are going to become the number one important thing. And the Kurds here cut straight through where the Tigris goes. And if they get all the way over this area, they could potentially threaten the edge of the Euphrates. If you know, the border here of the edge of Kurdish territory almost directly follows the Euphrates. So one of Turkey's most important assets, if they lose that territory, they also lose complete control over it. That's really scary. Got to keep moving, but it will come to other questions if we have time. So, Kurdish issue. We covered a bunch of this already, but 1984 is really when Kurdish fight for secession kicks off. It had been kicking around for a while, but they ratcheted it up into high gear in the 80s. Hang on one second. Did I miss a slide in here? Yeah, I totally did. Hang on one second. All right, I'm going to have to do this without the screen. Less than a second. So, in 1938, I'm sorry, we're rewinding a little. Because, yeah, I totally deleted one from this version. My bad. Um, so, 19, out of Turks in charge, creates all, uh, basically creates modern Turkey in 1924. R remains in power until about 1938. Dies in 1938. And then people are like, eh? What do we do now? They figured out, for the most part, things kind of bumped along. The Kurdish issue became a bit of an issue, but for the most part, things, things held together. Come World War II, Turkey stays mostly neutral. They technically declare war on Japan and Germany in the end, but don't engage in a single combat mission. They hang on to Ataturk's idea that Turkey should not be expansionist, should not look outward, it should take care of itself internally and not get involved in big wars, because the last time these people got involved in a big war did not go well for them. So they stay out of that for the most part. Shortly afterwards, in the time between around 1960 and uh, actually between 1950 and 1980, the military overthrows the government three separate times. About once every 10 years, the military sweeps in and goes, yeah, you're not doing the right stuff. You're gone. Uh, they kick the civilian government out of power. They usually hold power for about a year or two, and then they turn power back over to civilian authorities and leave, uh, which is, again, somewhat unusual. Most military coups end with some general in charge until he dies. Uh, in Turkey, there is actually a tradition of the military overthrowing the government, which is super weird, but occasionally it kind of works. Uh, and often really doesn't, but that's beside the point. So that's most of what happens during the Cold War period. Uh, uh, Turkey also joins NATO, and they are an incredibly important asset to the U.S. in NATO. Remember, hey, Russia, how you doing there? Hey, USSR, what's up? So Turkey becomes, if you remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, part of what that was about was not just rocket uh, missiles in, in Cuba. We also put missiles in Turkey right next to the USSR because they were part of NATO. Uh, so that was when Turkey finally rejoined the broader world and became more, started to look outward a little bit more than they had before. That's most of the Cold War period. 
toward the end of the Cold War, things with, things with the currents heat up a little bit, and that gets us here. So, 1984, when the PKK really starts rising up, becomes a, a fairly legitimate, well, a fairly effective group, engages in a lot of terrorism, blows up a bunch of people. It's really scary and really bad, and Turkey, understandably, gets, gets worried about it. The fighting spills over the border, like I mentioned. All, since all of that territory has Kurdish folks in it, and the borders are not really very well controlled, people easily can slip away into either Syria or into Iraq, or in some cases Iran, and that becomes a problem for Turkey. Get to 1990, now we've got Desert Storm. Now I suspect, usually when I'm talking to, to my students about this, they're all too young to have actually remembered any of this, and it's one of those, okay, history time. Um, you folks, I expect, mostly do remember. 1990s, Desert Storm, Iraq takes over Kuwait. We go, no, not cool. Go to the UN, the UN's like, yeah, that's not cool. Let's go get it, and we do. Uh, so, well, that was a very abridged version. That's pretty much, pretty much it. World shows up, kicks Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, does not hope to take him out of power. But, during Desert Storm, a couple things happen. First, Turkey lets the US launch airstrikes from its territory, but does not send troops to actively fight Saddam Hussein. They're still fairly isolationist. They're at the point where they'll let other countries do stuff through them, but are not too interested in fighting other countries' wars. Except when they can beat up the Kurds. So, Turkey sends, uh, sends 20,000 Turkish troops in the Kurdish areas of Iraq to try to defeat members of the PKK who would escape to there, or people who they thought might be members of the PKK. They are not always particularly surgical in these, in these particular attacks. 20,000 troops, it's kind of hard to beat. Uh, so they send troops into that area, they squish the Kurds, and then they go back home. 1995, they're still having problems with the PKK. Iraq is, you know, Saddam Hussein's there, it's stable-ish, but his, his grasp on power was never as solid after Desert Storm. So Turkey sends a second major offensive in there, this time I think it's 35,000 troops into the Kurdish areas, again, tries to wipe them out. Saddam Hussein doesn't really object, because he doesn't really like the Kurds that much either, because he's always afraid they're gonna break off and make their own state, and take away a huge chunk of his country in the process. So he's fine with someone else beating them up and basically lets it happen. The issues with the Kurds have continued until the present day in one form or another. Uh, midway through, I think it was around 2008, uh, the leader of the PKK was captured, and he's been in jail since then. Since then, I think it was in 2013, there was actually a ceasefire agreement that was signed uh, between him and the Turkish government where he said, all right, we're not gonna engage in violent resistance anymore. We think we can actually get what we want through democratic means, because Turkey's kind of, at this point, Turkey's actually lessened some of its restrictions on the Kurdish language, largely to pacify the EU and get the EU to potentially let them in. Uh, so the EU has been doing a lot for Kurds indirectly uh, and, uh, as this thing goes on. So this gets us to the most recent phenomenon in Turkey. While the Kurdish issue continues, there is one other big thing that's been rising, and that's political Islam. Uh, in 1996, uh, a group called the Welfare Party, it's the, one of the first explicitly Islamic parties uh, to, to really gain popularity, wins an election and forms a government. It's a parliamentary system, so they, you don't have to actually have a majority in order to, to form a government, you just have to have the most people. Are you all vaguely, is explanation of parliament useful? Yeah, okay, cool. Let me, quick, ex quick explanation on Parliament. U.S., we have a congressional system, right? So whichever party has the most votes, mostly gets to do their stuff. People theoretically cross the aisle sometimes. Nowadays, they really don't, but 15 or 20 years ago, it was not uncommon for actually bipartisan stuff to happen. In a parliamentary system, the way it works is when you go into the polls, you don't, you don't vote for candidate A or candidate B. You vote for party A or party B or party C. And the party, based on how many votes they get, puts people in office. And here's the really interesting thing. In a parliamentary system, there are usually many more than two parties. Uh, it's like Britain, there are three big parties right now, but there are about four or five other small ones. Uh, Israel right now has about three, not a very little, but about three or four major parties, and at least a dozen smaller parties. And here's why this actually matters. Here in the US, if you vote for the Green Party, you know a Green Party president for, uh, candidate for president will never get enough votes to be elected, right? So that vote, while it may have moral significance, doesn't have any practical political significance, except potentially pulling votes from somewhere else. In a parliamentary system, because you have all of these parties, your prime minister, your chief executive, is not elected separately. They're the person who's in charge of the biggest party. So whichever party gets the most votes, in theory, they get to select the prime minister. And so, I need volunteers. Uh, I, I'm gonna mandatorily volunteer people. Sorry about that. Actually, no, I'll take volunteers. Victims slash volunteers, raise a hand. 
There's one, there's two, I need two more. <coughs> Three. One more brave soul. Four, there we go. Um, what's your name now? Linda. Linda, and remind me? Jean. Four. Bob. Kathy. And Kathy. So, Linda, you control a political party. Your political party is the two rows behind you, as well as your current row. Uh, Jean, you control a political party. Your political party is these four people right here. Bob, was it? Yes. Yeah. Bob, you control a political party. Your political party is the uh, wonderful lady sitting next to you, the three gentlemen in front of you, and the three ladies in the two rows behind you. Captain, you control a political party. That's everybody else on this side. None of these parties. Oh, you folks back there. Uh, I need one more volunteer. Yay, what's your name, sir? Al. Al, you control a political party who is the back two rows over there. Okay. None of you folks have enough seats to actually run everything. <laughs> but if your party and Al's party got together with maybe Bob's party over here, or even Jean's party, even though she only has four people, that's enough to get you a majority. So all three of you folks get together and go, OK, all right, here's the deal. We're all going to work together. We're going to form a coalition, so basically a group that will generally vote, vote, vote in a unified fashion. And you're Linda, right? You're the biggest party, so you probably get the prime minister. But you tell, you'll tell Al, you know what? You can pick the minister of defense. Uh, and Gene, you really care about economics. You can pick the head of the central bank. That's the agreement that your party will make with these people so that you folks are now the majority and you govern. Everybody else is now the opposition. Uh, so what happens is anything you folks want to pass, you pass. Just unless it's insanely radical and some of your own party breaks ranks, which almost never happens, you get to run the government until either the next election or until there's what's called a vote of no confidence, which is where people decide, there are a bunch of different ways different governments do this, but where we get the sense that the country doesn't support you folks anymore. Uh, and enough of your people or enough of the other parties are like, maybe Gene's party's like, yeah, you gave me Minister of Finance or head of the Central Bank, but you have been passing a bunch of stuff that I absolutely hate. Like, the stuff that I agreed with you on, you're not doing any of that. So, I'm out. I'm leaving your coalition. And then, if you can't find anybody else to join you and give you a majority, we have to scrap everything and have new elections. Uh, and then, see how it falls out and do that process over. But part of what it means is if you're a small party like Bob or James, even if you have the smallest number of people, you can still be super important because in order to get over that 50% threshold, which you have to have in order to govern, if you can't do that, it's so like, uh, I'm Linda, right? Again, names. Uh, so if Linda tries to make a bunch of deals for her party and doesn't have any success, she's got like two weeks or so, she can't get, any, she can't get enough people together, then it goes to the next most populous party and they get to try to form a government instead and you may end up being in the opposition. So there's this incentive to build something and come together, but it also means that small parties can say, I know you need me. I know there's no way you're gonna get these people all the way on the other end of the political spectrum who hate you to agree. I might, but I really want this and 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 this. Oh, and that over there. And if you don't give it to me, I want ally with you and then you're totally screwed because you are gonna be out of power. Then I might be too, but it's more important to you than it is to me. So it means that very small parties can have a disproportionate impact on what happens, unlike the US, where if you're not one of the two major parties, it doesn't matter. So there are problems with this system as well, but it's just a fundamentally different and honestly fairly interesting system. And this is how it's done in England? Yep, that's the British system. The Canadian system is fairly similar as well. Same with the Israeli system. Uh, it's one of the other major political systems out there that democracies will use. Yeah. So in Turkey, you have, for the first time, so you've had small Islamic parties that have been the size of Bob or Jean's party in the past. But you've never had one that comes in first in an election and gets to form a government. This is the first time that happens in 1996. So the Welfare Party win the elections, they form a government. That works out pretty well until the military kicks them out of power two years later. Remember back to those six founding principles? Remember what one of them was? Secularism? Or, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, secularism, not sectarianism. Secularism, we are, not, or we are not a country of a particular religion. So the military shows up and says, your religious party, not okay, you're out. Uh, they then ban them from politics and prevent that party from ever existing again. Early 2000s, Turkey starts working for EMN. Yeah, after that, they give power to the next biggest party, basically, and they have new elections. Early 2000s, Turkey starts working for EU membership. They've been pushing for, for that kind of thing for a while. The EU's sort of been in development stages. 
And in doing that, they lift some of the bans on Kurdish culture and some of the bans on Kurdish language. They don't go too far, but they start moving down that path. 2002, another Islamic party, because they banned one, so another one gets created. They also go for the stand for an election called the Peace and Justice Party, and they win in a landslide. I think they may have won an outright majority, I'm not positive, uh, which is very rare in parliamentary systems. So they, they massively crush everybody else in the election. And they say, we are an Islamic party, but we're going to govern in a secular way. We're not going to impose Islamic law on anybody. It's just that our beliefs inform what we think is good, and we're going to try to govern the country that way. 2003, Tayyip Erdogan, who you're going to hear a lot about, uh, who's the head of the Peace and Justice Party, becomes the prime minister at that point. Uh, he, prior to this, wasn't able to run for office because uh, he had basically done an act of uh, Islam, uh, an act of protest uh, that the secular government had, had thrown him in jail for a short amount of time for. After 2002, when this, the Peace and Justice Party takes power, they change the law to make it so that things like that won't disqualify you from office. Uh, and so he then steps in and becomes the prime minister. He runs the country as prime minister for a while. Uh, except not that long for a while. Because in 2003, the military again says, ah, no, 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 we've tried this dance before. We know where it goes. You should be used to it by now. They try to launch a coup, and it fails. Uh, we think. And this is part of where we get into some of the fairly opaque nature of Turkish politics, because the controls on the media can be fairly significant. So Erdogan tells us there's a potential coup. There, in that there are some members of the military, though not the military as a whole, who tries to take over. Uh, he says, potential coup, we foiled it, it's fine. All of these people who are involved, uh, you're all now in prison. Uh, you're in trials and whatnot eventually. We don't honestly know uh, to what extent this was an actual coup or to what, what extent it was something that was drummed up in order for him to take out some of his political opponents. There was probably some truth to it, because there are definitely some military members who are fairly agitated and were in some way involved. But again, we don't know if it was deliberately, one of the major theories is that it was in the process of forming, and he used people to push it to have it happen before it would have naturally happened, so it could be crushed, and so it could then be used as an excuse to crack down. Yeah? Just a point, given yeah. his, uh, what has happened since then, mm -hmm. more than likely it was at least yeah. half of a, an yep. excuse to imprison Partially because the people who were imprisoned in this, of the trials for a lot of them, just completed, and a huge chunk of them were found not guilty, uh, which suggests that it probably was not as big a thing as it was made out to be at the time. But at the time, it's not an unreasonable thing to suggest. Like, the military overthrows religious parties in Turkey on a fairly regular basis. Saying the military tried to institute a coup against you is not an unreasonable claim for him to make. So people at the time, by and large, accepted it. That gets us to more modern history. So between 2003 and 2011, the government has slowly and gradually increased police powers a bit. Part of that is because after September 11th, the whole world goes on higher alert about terrorism. Al-Qaeda becomes more of an active, prominent force that they're more concerned about. The US going into Iraq destabilizes the heck out of Iraq. So you have Al-Qaeda affiliates that weren't there before, but are now going there. And part of how they're trying to get there sometimes is through Turkey. So Turkey steps up police powers. It also uses that to sometimes crack down on opposition more, more significantly. Uh, they also gradually decrease freedom of the press a little bit for national security reasons. But religious parties have started to become more and more accepted. They're closer to being mainstream. It's a slow move, but they're getting there. 2011, the Syrian civil war really gets going. Uh, and this is probably the defining, this and the Iraq war, uh, the 2003 Iraq war, are two of the most defining incidents in the Middle East in the last, and probably through the end of 2020 something else big happens. A Syrian civil war, super big deal. Uh, and the reason, again, going back to our map, ah, shouldn't have learned so far back. There, back to our map, Syria. So if you look down here, so you've got Aleppo, which is one of the major cities that's involved, and Hama, Damascus is all the way down here. So this is where the heart of the Syrian government is, and this is the central front for all the fighting, which means most of the opposition is concentrated up here and over here. How do you get to up here and over here? Uh, or you go through or come in through Iraq, which happened for a lot of folks who are already in the area. But if you're coming from Europe, you definitely go straight through Turkey. Uh, so there's a major flood of jihadi folks who come through Turkey. Most of them don't stop or stay there. They're going to Syria, but still you've got people like that passing through. And if you are someone who is wants who is who believes that the correct government is a religious government that imposes strict religious law on everyone, that is specifically Muslim law, 
you've got as much of a problem with a secular state of Muslim people as you do with a state ruled by people with the wrong religion. Did that make sense? Like Saddam Hussein was despised. Like oh God, Osama bin Laden hated Saddam Hussein with a bloody passion because he was basically a secular leader of a Muslim nation, which bin Laden saw as a betrayal of his obligation to his fellow, uh, to his fellow Muslims. Uh, in a similar way, the government of Turkey is often viewed fairly negatively by those folks because they should be doing this sort of thing and they aren't. And in some ways, they know better, at least according to these folks, they should know better because they are Muslim. They should know these things, whereas at least people who aren't Muslim might be ignorant of their responsibilities, is the idea. So Turkey has a lot of problems with these folks indirectly, and it presents uh, significant concern, at least. Let's see, we got, uh, yeah. so, Got those groups coming through, the Syrian civil war begins. There's another person in 2014 that becomes a big issue, and that's this guy, Fethullah Gulen. Uh, he is a cleric who was part of the Peace and Justice Party back in the day. He was actually an ally of Erdogan's. Uh, but over time, they've come to different conclusions about who, how power should be distributed. It's a bunch of small internal power struggle things. But he has been forced to flee Turkey, and he actually lives in Pennsylvania in the United States, and has since uh, a little before this. Uh, but from a distance, they, he's still got a lot of ties and a lot of influence back in Turkey, and so he and, and Erdogan are both sort of struggling for who's in charge of the party. Erdogan is still very much in power, but he's very worried about this guy. Um, this guy's starting to make more inroads. <laughs> People asked about Kurds in politics. 2015, pro-Kurdish party, the HDP, wins enough seats to prevent Erdogan from further expanding his powers. That's the other thing. Over the years, Erdogan in this time period has become president, uh, which used to be a very ceremonial role. Uh, they have amended the Constitution to make it a very strong executive role. The president gets to appoint Supreme Court justices, the president gets to remake most of the bureaucracies, gets to institute a bunch of sweeping national security stuff. The presidency has become an incredibly powerful position, and Erdogan now holds it. And the, con the, his, the parliament is still controlled by his party. They're still the biggest party there. And they want to pass a bunch of stuff to give the presidency even more powers, knowing it's Erdogan now and probably will be Erdogan in the future. The Kurds win enough votes to break up that coalition and prevent the, the Peace and Justice Party from giving him even more power in 2015. But it marks them entering into politics in a very significant, coordinated way, which they haven't really done as much before. The military attempts another coup in 2016 and fails. This one is one you may have heard about somewhat recently. This is just a few years ago. Details here are interesting. So, a little like the 2003 one, it was partially formed from what we can tell. Not the full-on sweeping whole military together thing that you got in the, during the Cold War period. Afterwards, well, actually, details of it, I'll get, to, I'll get to first. So, partially formed, the military rolls out. Erdogan is actually out of the country when it happens. He's in Europe. And so he FaceTimes back to Turkey and says to the people, the military is trying to overthrow our government that you elected. Go out in the streets, stand in front of the tanks, make them see that you want democracy, not military rule. Show them you believe in this. And the people do. I, by and large, the people, he has been overwhelmingly popular. He's been elected multiple times. People tend to like this guy. And for the most part, economically, Turkey's been doing okay. So people go out in the streets, the military, like, you see fighter jets that literally drop bombs toward the capital. And it's not enough. People push the military out, the military leaves, Erdogan stays in power. Afterwards, the government detains thousands and thousands of people, uh, some of whom may have been tangentially involved, many of whom probably were not. Among those people is a guy who ends up becoming much more important than we would expect, a guy named Andrew Brunson. He is a pastor who was born in the US, a uh, Christian, who was over in Turkey doing missionary work there. Uh, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry, I had a question. Uh, but yeah, he is one of the people who was in prison uh, in Turkey, uh, thrown into prison for a year or so, uh, because the Turkish government says you might have been involved. Specifically, Erdogan claims that he is connected with Gulen. Remember this guy that he's got this power struggle with back in the U.S. Erdogan says you're working with Gulen, and in fact, this whole thing was Gulen's fault. We have no idea if that is true or not. And certainly, haven't seen any evidence to back it up. Uh, so. I, my personal opinion is that it probably was not his fault in any way, because as far as we know, Gulen does not have significant military contacts. His contacts and most of his work is much more in the civilian sphere. Uh, and Turkey has presented no compelling evidence. But it is a convenient way to blame a political opponent for a disaster. So there's that. Uh, so Brunson gets, gets imprisoned. 
Erdogan blames Gulen and he tells the US, Gulen's a criminal, extradite him to Turkey. Uh, and the US is like, um, evidence? Extradition requires you to have a compelling claim that someone's committed a crime. Is there any? Turkey's like, eh, don't worry about it, just send him over. And we're like, uh, really? Yeah, totally, he'll be fine. <laughs> what they're basically doing is Erdogan is using the event to justify moves against his political opponents and consolidating power, but as well, but as well, he's trying to get the US to give him Gulen in exchange for this pastor. And the reason this matters is evangelicals in the United States are a very significant voting bloc, and this guy, while he's not a huge figure there, the idea that a Christian missionary, now he's under house arrest actually, rather than uh, in prison, but the idea that a Christian missionary is being detained in a Muslim country is something that has energized them. They've been petitioning the administration consistently for his release. Uh, and Trump uh, has been so far unwilling to, uh, to do what it looks like Turkey wants, which is give up a political opponent in exchange for him. Uh, Turkey has not flat out come, has not come out and said directly, that's the exchange we want, but they have largely made it known to political back channels. Yeah? There's a lot more to that. Absolutely, a but we only have 15 minutes. It's, it's, <laughs> it's significant because if they, Turkey does get what it wants, yeah. the Muslim power is going to increase, and there's going to be much more um, just jailing of their own people even that may not agree with Erdogan because I know yep. there are a lot of students and oh, yeah. educated people that see that he's going much more toward being a dictator oh, yeah. than an elected official. Very much agree. So not only that, but he has sent the Navy to circle certain Greek islands. Mm -hmm. He's becoming a threat. Yep. So And part of that also has to deal with geopolitics in the in order for Turkey to effectively project power in the Mediterranean. There are a couple different areas they need to lock down, Cyprus being one of those areas is particularly relevant to them. That is a whole different thing that if we had time we would get into, but we have 12 minutes before I have to jump in my car and speak toward my children. So <laughs> I'm going to table that for right now. Uh, but know that a lot of that is about uh, the ability to strategically deploy where they need and want to. Can you hold it for me for right now? And then if we have time as soon as we finish this, I'm happy to go there. Uh, but, yeah, the catch here is all of this has been a way for Erdogan to consolidate power. We don't know to what extent these things are manufactured and he's being um, sort of Machiavelli behind the scenes, or to what degree he is just effectively capitalizing on events as they occur. But there really can't be much dispute that his degree of power and control over the country has been steadily increasing. And again, part of what, what's at, at stake, or part of what makes this complicated is the people of Turkey overwhelmingly are Muslim, and a very large portion of whom want a government that reflects their views. In the same way, again, in the United States, if you ran for office as an atheist, I guarantee you, you will never be elected senator. You sure as heck won't be elected president. Right? And we are a technically secular country as well, officially, in some ways. Uh, so in a similar sort of way, folks there want a government that reflects that, but the structure that was set up by Ataturk is very much opposed to it. So there's that struggle between the very strong history of what it is to be Turkish that's been created and the, the current desires of some of the people there. Um, we don't really know which way that will tip, especially because there's so much chaos in the region right now and because it's so easy to see Islam as being persecuted by the Western world, which between Iraq and a number of other places, there, there are ways you can make that argument fairly compellingly. Uh, it's those folks have been fairly active politically in a way that they have not been driven before. So, let's get to the last bit. 2017, Turkey launches airstrikes on the Kurds. Surprise, surprise. Uh, specifically, the Kurdish forces that are in Syria that are helping the U.S. fight ISIS. Uh, they see an opportunity, uh, and again, they're worried about the Kurds. Because part of what's happened is, you know that big, that area of Kurdish territory in Syria that we saw earlier? The Kurds have taken control of part of that and are basically governing it and running it as if it's theirs. Uh, the Syrian army is largely way down near Damascus. They're dealing with all the fighting down there. They don't really care about this top corner, partially because they figure Turkey will deal with it, because Turkey doesn't like Kurds having power, but also partially because it's a long way to try to get their troops and planes and whatnot. They've got more immediate problems to solve. So the Kurds have basically set up an area of control, almost like Iraq's area, where they're largely running what's going on there. Turkey gets really worried about that because the more that's successful, the easier it is for that to creep across the border into Turkey and for that terrifying Kurdish state to emerge, at least for them. So they strike, 
They also take a huge chunk of that territory back, so they're administering a portion of territory in Syria. Again, Syria is too busy with problems in the south, and Syria doesn't, the Syrian government doesn't really like the Kurds either, so they'd rather have Turkey controlling that area than the Kurds, so they don't mind. Uh, but it's another example of that happening. 2018, our relations start to degrade. Uh, Pastor Brunson ends up under house arrest, they let him out of jail, and they lock him up in a house with you know, an ankle bracelet and stuff. Uh, but this is where Erdogan starts pushing for Gulen's extradition. Uh, U.S. evangelicals pressure us pretty strongly, and the U.S. is unwilling to extradite him. What we do do, and this is something that has not gotten much media attention, but probably should, we've slapped san economic sanctions on Turkey, and they have really started to fight. The lira has dropped almost 40% in the last year. Uh, Turkey's currency has been in free fall. Uh, they just, I think it was yesterday, uh, approved a measure in their central bank to try to hold that. Uh, but yeah, their economies in shambles, or at least going that way, largely because of these sanctions, and we aren't really paying any attention to them. Uh, but that was done largely, politically speaking, to try to pressure them to get runs at least. Uh, and Erdogan, because he sees Gulen as his single biggest opponent, doesn't want to give up what he thinks is his biggest bargaining chip to get that guy, so he's unwilling to release Bronson to get the sanctions ended. At least that's what we're standing now. Why has the U.S. given given them Gulen? That's actually a really good question. I don't have a good answer. I mean, I mean, well, why? Why has it been gone and watching in D.C.? You know, that's yeah. inexplicable. Why? Yeah. Be why hasn't the U.S. extradited Gulen? Uh, the political yeah. opponent who's living here. Why haven't we given him back to Turkey? And I personally don't have a great answer to that, except that actually our extradition laws may prohibit it unless we're presented with credible evidence of a crime he's committed. We probably have a fair amount of flexibility in ignoring those if we want to, <laughs> but honestly, I think more of it is, actually, no, I, I do not have a good answer, I wish I did. Uh, let, me, let me go there and then there and then there. Go ahead. Um, what I read was the CIA is protecting Probably true. Uh, because it's almost certain that Erdogan would love to, would be just as happy if he were dead as if he were extradited. Uh, so I would not be even slightly surprised if assassination attempts are in the works. Uh, yeah. Go ahead to you next, Pamela. Why would we slap sanctions on Turkey? Because, oh, because the voting block in question has a lot of, uh, why would we put sanctions on Turkey over one person? Uh, and. Again, the evangelical voting bloc, if Trump loses that, he loses. Right? If they were essential to his re-election, Mike Pence is very directly plugged into that community. They are the center of a lot of his political base of power, and we can't press. Uh, what, was, uh, what was your question now? It's more of a comment. I don't think it's just the evangelicals is one aspect mm -hmm. of that, but Turkey has become far less than the ally was to the but US. And if the Muslims start to become much more in control, they might get the same type of radical problems that they raised with Iraq and Iran. Possible, yeah. So there's a lot of things there that Agreed. It, you're weakening the guy's power base economically by you know, putting the same. That's fair. Uh, to, to be honest, my response is more an analysis of the current individuals who hold power in the U.S. government and what rationale they are likely acting on, though I expect all of the more rank and file diplomats, CIA, State Department, etc., they're more likely doing it for the reasons that you were talking about. Well, the thing is, you may or may not like Trump, and he certainly has done all kinds of weird things, but there's certain uh, things that have much wider ramifications in the U.S. Oh, I definitely agree with you. So. Uh, so, again, a longer discussion. If we have more time, I would very much enjoy engaging. Uh, but, main challenges the U.S. I think needs to consider in the coming years. First, what the heck are we going to do with the Kurds? Especially because we have screwed these people over multiple times. Uh, during Desert Storm, uh, we said, if you rise up against Saddam Hussein, we will come in, we will protect you, we will take you out of power, we will give you your own state, and make sure no one can ever do to you what he did earlier. I, I am frankly surprised that they've worked with us again since then. I, I did not think they would, uh, but when you're desperate, you take it again. In addition to that, we've been helping them out now in Syria and elsewhere. They have been instrumental in us pushing back ISIS, which has been our primary foreign policy goal in the Middle East for years. And we've given them some degree of support, and we don't know what promises we have or have not made to them. But I, I'm, again, frankly surprised they've helped us as much as they have. If we don't, again, help them get a state of some kind or some degree of autonomy or respect, 
I think we're going to have a lot more problems in that area than we've had before, especially because they are a much stronger opposition force than ISIS or anything else like that. I, if they decided to make life hell for people in the region, they could absolutely do it. Uh, second, Erdogan's power has continued to expand. Turkey has continued to become more and more authoritarian. That's a slide that is unlikely to stop unless something stops the end. Uh, and I frankly don't know how that's going to work out the constitutions, but it meant that I believe the letting stay in power until 2029. I'm not positive about the year there. Uh, it was amended to grant him a longer potential term. Uh, and it can be amended again. Remember, Turkey can amend its constitution more easily than a lot of other places, continuing reform. Not all reforms are good. In this case, it might not be, but it's easier for them to do. So that's something that's going to become an issue. From the US perspective, it may just be another strong man in the region, like think Saudi Arabia, think Iraq before the Gulf War, that where we don't like the person who's in charge, but that person is a useful piece on the game board against people we are more worried about. To the extent to which Turkey is opposed to Iran and Turkey is opposed to Russia, they become an important ally for us to maintain. We may be fine maintaining that even if they are no longer a democratic, or at least a much less democratic place. Finally, sectarian politics are on the rise there. I think this gets to the issue you're speaking about, man, in terms of more and more power on the part of religious groups there. That can be good, can be bad. We've more often seen the bad end of it, but that doesn't mean that's the only end. At the very least, it represents a change in what Turkey is, what we can expect from it, and what it's likely to look like, as well as what its external ambitions are. Additionally, our commitment to NATO has been shaky. Uh, part of this is something that the change in administration has brought about. Part of it is an issue of rhetoric and presentation as opposed to reality. But one thing that's important to remember is NATO, since the end of the Cold War, NATO's relevance has changed. It's not that it isn't relevant, but what it does for us is different. The alliance, the Warsaw Pact, which it was designed to oppose, has ceased to exist. So in some ways, being without NATO is less of a concern, or more particularly, being without certain parts of NATO may be less of a concern. Given our setup with the government in Iraq, we have basing rights out of there, at least in some times. Uh, so it may be, if we can set up a clearer thing there, that we don't need Turkey as much because we'll have another place to protect power from. So Turkey's role in NATO and our commitment to NATO are both a little bit shaky now, much more so than they were before. And a conversation that's worth having, uh, I think, as citizens, is how, how important is the alliance today compared to how important it used to be? How much are we willing to sacrifice to maintain it in its current form uh, versus how much we get out of it? And I think that's a worthwhile discussion. So, the questions that if we had more time, I would suggest today, are these. Should we advocate for a Kurdish state? If so, how, where would it be, and how are we going to deal with Turkey flipping out when we do? <laughs> Second, should we find some way to push back against Turkey's authoritarianism? If so, how the heck do we do it? Uh, especially when we may be picking up some more authoritarian tendencies at times, uh, which arguably we've been doing since 9-11. Uh, because as security has become a bigger concern, we've been more okay with restrictions on privacy, with extrajudicial killings and detentions, as long as we maintain Guantanamo Bay and a drone warfare program, as well as uh, pervasive spying on citizens. It's a little hard to tell other people, you're starting to look authoritarian. <laughs> and we would know. I mean, uh, yeah. So we may not have as many tools there. Other allies like the EU are likely to go to be in a much better position. Finally, how important is Turkey post Cold War? Uh, it may be an instance where the commitment to the region is less significant than we think. On the flip side, if Russia continues to rise in power, Turkey becomes absolutely essential because there are a number of pipelines that export Russian petrochemicals. You, you cross the sea and then you cross Turkey to get them to Europe, especially if either Estonia or Ukraine shuts off that continued passage of gas. Russia cannot survive economically without Turkey, um, without the ability to send economic to send product through there. So that potentially makes it an economic partner and a military asset if a conflict with them arises or escalates. Is Russia courting Turkey now? They have been for a while. If you remember, there was a, a what about a year or so ago, uh, a Russian jet got shot down by by Turkish folks in Syria. Normally, that would have started World War III. And straight up, a NATO country shoots down a Russian plane. Holy crap. Like, <laughs> DEFCON 1, people. That's, that should have ended a lot of things. Russia didn't respond in that kind of way over it. Uh, they basically went to Turkey and said, you done screwed up. We're going to talk about how you can make this not disastrous for you. Have a seat. Oh. 
<laughs> and that's kind of where we are now. Uh, they have come to a degree of resolution over it, and Turkey is moving closer in Russia's direction, partially because we are aiding the Kurds, who they very much don't like. Turkey is in the process of potentially realigning itself, uh, and that is potentially very scary. Why did Turkey shoot them? Partially it's because they've told Russia multiple times, stay out of this airspace, it's ours. Russia's plane was there doing some operations in Syria, but again, Syria and Turkish border crossed the line. They said they'd shoot it down, and they did, uh, but still, NATO countries don't shoot down Russian planes without consequences. That is unfortunately all the time that I have. I can take one more question. If you want to have one that you didn't have a chance to ask, sir, I'd love to hear it. Um, what do the fossil fuel companies, uh, you know, how, how do they affect this? Or how are they, uh, what, what, what is that point? Uh, how long you got? <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of key pipelines that run through there. Also, Turkey is one of your main access, access points to the Mediterranean. Uh, so it becomes incredibly important to them there. Those companies largely want stability there. War and chaos going on, they can't do business. So they would much prefer a stable autocratic government over a more chaotic democratic one if they have to choose. Uh, there are people who dispute that, and I think there are good arguments the other way, but I think that is likely the way they would prefer it to shake down. Yeah? If you go back quite a few slides, I'm going back quite a few. I like everything about the program. I have million questions and yeah. quite a few like different ideas. But sure. one of the things that you mentioned there, you said that. When there was a war desert storm, Turkey lets U.S. That's not true. They didn't let us base out they, there. They, they, they let they us go through it. They didn't let us base from Diyarbakir, and U.S. troops had to go through the Mediterranean, through the Swiss Canal, to fight Iraq from the southern part. They yep. And because the Turks said, listen, they played two games. They went to the United States and Europe. We Europeans like you. You know, you go to the Arab Muslim countries and say, we are Muslim like you. Yep. That's a history. Yep. So sure. the United States troops they were put in danger because they could not use the southern borders of Turkey right. to fight the Iraq. We couldn't move the troops through there. They would not let us base planes out of there. They did let us pass through their airspace with bombers. That was the only thing that they let us do, and that was their, that was how they split the difference. They could tell Muslim nations, we're not letting troops go through there. We're not letting them use our territory. They could tell us, you're getting our airspace. Be happy with that. Uh, and you're, you're correct, though. I think I may have oversold which direction that went in, and it was more split down the middle because Turkey's position means it very much is balancing a commitment to the Middle East and a commitment to Europe. It lies right between the two. And they also played a good game with ISIS. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Erdogan's son mm -hmm. uh, used to buy petroleum from ISIS to make money, and his daughter used to have a hospital in Turkey to treat the wounded ISIS people. So that way, the ISIS were attacking the Kurds, so they played that game too. And there are evidence a little mixed on that, but that's at least an allegation that is worth investigating now that they're potential. I can take one more that I didn't have a chance to get to, and then I do have to go. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned. You get uh, one, though, because I'm out of time. Control <laughs> of airspace. Uh, they, there is a, in Cyrillic, we run missions out of there in that area. And quickly, we, not mentioned was the continued control of the Bosphorus, which is very yeah. important to Turkey. Agreed. They have a very tentative base on, uh, on the Mediterranean now. Yeah. No guaranteed future there. Okay. So they're a player with. Uh, with uh, Russia in that regard as well. Yep. Russia's seizure of Crimea makes them a little less dependent on some of those things because of where, of where it lets them project. But yeah, absolutely. You still need access to the Black Sea. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you'll see you